Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So in today's session, I like to discuss a little bit the calibration of our interest rate curves. So multi-curve interest rate calibration, interest rate curve calibration. Yeah, at the first step is building the curve and valuing financial products. So I try to build a flexible framework to value linear interest rate products. So plain coupon bonds, swaps from a given set of interest rate curves. So on one side, we have our curves, discount curves, forward curve. Okay, so maybe they form a set of multiple curves, maybe we call that a kind of a model. And from that, I can value financial products. So there are different products here. Okay, so for example, such a product has um, a method and that method requires as an argument, the model, Let's say our curve model. Because maybe the financial product needs to calculate the value, it needs different curves. So if we go back to this, for example, theorem 179, there we defined the value of our generalized swap leg and that generalized swap rack had a dependency on a discount curve. So zero copper bond prices for certain maturities when the payment occurs. And it has a dependency on our forward curve, which was encoding the value of paying that index fixed at a certain time, paid at a certain time. So that was our forward curve. And you already see here that there are maybe uh, complex dependencies between the curve because if you like to match a certain price, yeah, for example, the discount curve is already given. That one is already given. And now you like to match a certain price by adjusting the forward curve. Then, okay, you can create some kind of solver, some kind of optimizer that finds maybe the optimal shape, the optimal values of the forward curve. But you see that there is a dependency on the discount curve. So whenever you find, whenever you change the discount curve, you have to change maybe the forward curve if you like to match the previous price. We also had the setup here in our section on collateralized interest rate derivatives. So it was clearly the same stuff. There was the collateral curve. So the zero copper bond price associated with the interest rate accruing the collateral. And then there was the value of paying the index at a future point in time when this payment is collateralized by that curve. Huh? So we had here also the collateral curve. So it's exactly the same same setup. So this inversion is then called calibration. So calibration means that I observe financial products on the market and I would like to infer the corresponding curves. This is calibration. So our setup should allow to calibrate that set of curve, curves to observed market data, which is just the inversion of the valuation. But you see, to make this calibration working, uh, our setup also has to reflect these uh, dependencies. Yeah, So the forward curve has to recognize uh, if we change uh, the discount curve. Either because 
in the valuation formula for a given swap, where we changed the forward to match that swap, that one depends on the discount curve. So changing the discount curve would require a recalibration of the forward curve. Or it could be that if we are in this special situation of the collateralized setup where we recover the single curve theory, it could be that the forward curve is just defined in terms of the discount curve. Yeah? So we had the special setup that, for example, if the index is a backward rate on the collateral account, then it's just a function of the discount curve. So there will be a curve that is a function of another curve. Yeah? So we have to model in our implementation. So we have to model in our implementation these uh, dependencies. So this is a little bit what I mean here. So I like to design a flexible framework yeah, where I can then easily implement such an optimization algorithm, such a calibration. Before I start with this, let's discuss curves in general. So when I speak about a curve, it's just fitting points in R2. And there are two popular approaches. We could create um, a kind of a fitting. So fitting a larger set of observed points of observed product values to a curve. So for such a fitting algorithm, it's maybe perfectly okay to observe different values for the same argument, yeah? like that. Okay. And maybe now you like to fit a curve that minimizes some 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 norm okay so maybe this fitting here would be more realistic if there are not so many points here okay so that's a kind of of a fitting uh, is also an important numerical algorithm in some cases for example if you observe yeah multiple bond prices from a certain sector, yeah, where are different companies belonging to a sector, and you would like to calculate maybe some kind of average bond price curve. Okay, then you you are actually averaging out some um yeah, some criteria that creates different different prices. Uh, what we do here is derivative valuation, interest rate derivative valuation, where the market is actually yeah, much tighter. Uh, so there is a single product yeah, for a certain maturity. So we are more on the side that we like to interpolate values. So we observe maybe n products and we like to find a curve that is parameterized by n parameters such that the curve reproduces the um, observed quantities uh, in an exact way. So we are maybe then more in the regime that we observe for, say, certain maturity, certain values, and we would like to find, yeah, say, some good function that interpolates these values. So we are reproducing these values here on the curve exactly. And what we do in between, so this is our interpolation. So what we do in between allows us then to value other financial products, financial products which we do not observe. Uh, yeah, so for example, a swap that pays at the, at a point where we have not observed previously a product on the market. And our interpolation, this is a model. So whether we assume a piecewise constant, a piecewise linear, some smooth spline interpolation, so this is a model. So what I like to do today is to discuss with you a little bit this 
setup, but I also have an example for the setup well of a low parametric curve that is used to fit observed uh, bond prices, for example. So an example for this, a low parametric curve that is fitting maybe multiple bond prices is the Nelson Siegel Svensson curve. So you see it is a bond price curve that has here is the interpolating entity, the continuously compounding rate. Yeah? And that rate is now modeled by a curve. Yeah? So R of T depends on, okay, so what are my parameters? So my parameters are a parameter beta zero. Yeah? So maybe some constant value, then beta one, beta two, beta three. And inside you see x zero and tau zero and x one and tau one. So these are say times yeah, for parametrizing exponential decaying functions. Yeah, So it's a little, a little bit an overlay of an exponential, of two exponential decaying functions there. Yeah. Um, okay, so this function, yeah, so this model for a curve, yeah, is popular in certain applications. It plays not a large role here in the valuation of interest rate derivatives, say, swaps. Yeah? So there we are more here in the second regime that I like to find an interpolating curve for the observed market instruments. So going to interpolating curves, I will introduce two or three properties, the interpolation method. Of course, there's also an extrapolation method. So what should we model for the regime for the maturities that we do not observe. And there is a thing which I call the interpolating or, the, or interpolation entity. So I consider the special case of interpolating values x, y, x is the argument, yeah? y is the value. So in um, R2, and I'm looking for some interpolating function y is f of x. And of course, this function should interpolate. So it should rep reproduce yi if I plug in xi. So in finding this function, the x1, y1 to xn, yn, so my observed points, these are somehow parameters to the functions. So when I define a certain algorithm that creates these functions, these parameters are the input and I get out the function. When I change these parameters here, I get, of course, a different interpolating function. And our application or our first application is to construct a zero Cooper bond curve. So that's my application. So I like to construct the zero Cooper bond curve. So maybe you can think of our single curve theory here. So when we have the zero Cooper bond curve, I can calculate the forward curve, which allows me then to value all linear, linear products. Yeah? So here for this application, a model for a zero Cooper bond curve yeah, is, is enough. So clearly we have the property that the curve should interpolate our values. So alternatively, there is the property that we have a fitting which you could reformulate that you are 
minimizing the distance of the predicted value. The predicted value is here my f of xi and the observed value, my yi, that you minimize the distance in a certain norm. Okay, so there is a certain norm here, yeah, which you could which you could specify. I'm focusing on curves that do interpolation. So there are some additional properties that are of interest to us. Okay, so for example, I would like to have some kind of continuity, or let's phrase it as robustness. So my algorithm should be continuous in the parameters xi, yi. So if xi, yi are the observed values on the market, okay, then I do not like that my curve makes a huge jump if I make a very small change to an observation, uh, because that would mean that the valuation of my financial product uh, is not continuous in the observation I have on the market. Yeah, And now think of risk-neutral valuation means replication. So it means that your model tells you in order to replicate this financial product, you have to buy these instruments on the market. So if this dependency is discontinuous, or even if it is not differentiable, then you have a problem because in your trading strategy, that would introduce a shock, a jump. Yeah? So this is really an important aspect. It should be continuous or even smooth yeah, in the uh, parameters. Maybe at first you think this is even more important, but for us it is not so important. Uh, the function should be continuous in the argument uh, x. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, you, you can use um, a discontinuous uh, function and you will see that it is not so harmful. It is much more harmful to have um, a discontinuous or non-smooth functions in the parameters in the algorithm. Next, there is another interesting property, maybe also not immediately obvious, that I would like to have something like that. And that's a kind of locality. So what do I mean by that? So if the parameter x yeah, has, for example, the interpretation of time, like a maturity, Okay, so think of the case that I would like to fit a zero Cooper bond curve. Yeah, I observe, say today in zero, the bond prices for different maturities. Okay, then you know you can calculate forward rates. So forward rates from T1 to T2, yeah, also observed in uh, T0, the forward rate for a certain period think of the single curve setup. So this is the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period. Okay, I dropped the observation in zero just to save some space here, divided by the bond at the end of the period and the period length. Okay, so you can think of your zero Cooper bond curve that is here. Okay, but maybe the zero Cooper bond curve is associated maybe with interest rates. Okay, let's call these interest rates here F. Okay, so there are some interest rate periods. Maybe think of periods here. Well, then what do I mean with this locality? It means that earlier predictions of my function they should not depend on later data. So that means if you now value a financial product with your curve and your financial product, say, has a maturity here, yeah. so it depends on, say, this rate, this rate, and this rate, then the valuation of this financial product should maybe not depend on what you observe in the future. So should not depend on data that 
influence your curve far beyond that maturity. It could be maybe that data here influences maybe something you have here. Because if you just have an observation point here and here, yeah, then maybe this guy is an interpolation of this one and that one. Yeah. So um, it could be that you have maybe here some kind of K plus one or so. Yeah. So um, maybe that's not so strict. Yeah. But it would be really strange if you have a two year swap that depends on something you observe for a 10 year interest rate, yeah, but you do not observe in an eight year interest rate. That's strange because that would mean that the trader to hedge, to replicate the two year product, he should buy some eight year, 10 year, whatever financial interest, interest rate product. Um, so that's an interesting aspect. And this aspect comes from our application. And um, the thing is that this aspect is introducing to some extent some kind of discontinuity or the requirement to have some kind of discontinuity or non-smoothness in the argument. Because if the curve does not change here, if I change something nearby, that's maybe only possible if the curve is allowed to break up at that point. So maybe that's already a nice remark here. Yeah? As a mathematician, you would think, okay, let's use some very good, some fancy interpolation method. Let's use cubic spline. Yet let's use harmonic spline or something like that. It's very smooth. Yeah? But then you violate this um, this uh, requirement that your interpolation should have some kind of uh, locality property, which is interesting from a hedging uh, perspective. So when you use this model to calculate which financial products should you use to neutralize uh, your risk. Yeah? So you have to be a little bit careful if the interpolation, the smoothness uh, introducing some introduces some far-reaching dependencies, uh, which you actually do not like to see in your model. I will have a nice coding example for this yeah, in a few minutes. And let's continue. Of course, um, I also have as a requirement um, extrapolation. The function should have some reasonable extrapolation method. Also reasonable means that it fits to our application. So speaking of that fits to our application, that's another point. So there are maybe some additional constraints that come from our application. So for example, there could be the requirement that the curve should stay positive. Yeah. So when I observe positive values, I would like to have the interpolation to stay positive. You can easily construct an example for cubic spline that is violating this. If you use, for example, this input data in a cubic spline and here this line is uh, zero okay so you would like to have your data be non-negative yeah but if you do a cubic spline interpolation of this data you would see something like that because this the spline has to be smooth yeah so maybe we have something like that okay So you can easily construct interpolation algorithms that um, do not have this property that if you observe positive values, that the interpolation remains positive. So there could be an additional requirement, for example, positivity or also monotonicity, uh, depending on the nature of the value Y. Yeah? So for example, if Y is um, a zero copper bond price, and X is the maturity, then I would like to have that the value is positive. If our curve is, for example, the, the price curve of an option, depending on the strike, you know, think of Black-Schultz formula, depending on the strike, 
then absence of arbitrage implies that, okay, the second derivative um, is positive. So the density is not allowed to be negative. So the first derivative has to be monotone. The function itself has to be convex. So when I observe convex interpolation points, I would like to have the interpolation convex. So that's really a difficult thing. The funny thing is that the most trivial interpolation methods like piecewise constant or piecewise linear easily fulfill this. And that's the reason why piecewise constant and piecewise linear is very popular. So it is because all the other algorithms introduce some far-reaching dependencies or some, some um, issues. And there is another technique to make piecewise constant or piecewise linear work nicely. Um, because we have another degree of freedom, and that degree of freedom is what is the quantity that we interpolate? We could create some transformation. For example, if you go back to this example of the zero copper bond curve, and I would like to have positivity, then an easy trick is to take the logarithm of the observed values, interpolate the logarithm of these, and then take the exponential of the interpolating function. That is guaranteeing that if I have observed positive values, I interpolate with a function that is always positive. So if we require y to be positive, we could just interpolate points z, so xi, zi, where the z are the logarithm, and then I create an interpolating function for that and transform it back to my original value y. Yeah? So I take exponential h of x, where h is the interpolating function. So the question is, what is the object that I interpolate? Or also to make it a little bit more complex, if you have a zero copper bond curve, the zero copper bond curve for the very simple model is just the one that has, say, a single constant rate r. So, and it is an e to the minus rt. Yeah, so that's a classic one parametric. A zero Cooper bond curve, yeah, so like that. So here's the one. So maybe you would like to have your model that if your observed points are of this form, then the interpolation should also be of this form. So maybe there is some natural form. So once you observe the data is in this form, the interpolation should be of this form. So this means that you transform maybe to the R, okay? So you have here the R inside, and the value that you interpolate is the quantity R, so that's the logarithm of the bond price divided by the maturity, yeah? or my, minus logarithm of P divided by maturity. So you interpolate the R, and then you can re retransform. So this motivates the idea to introduce an interpolation entity. So my interpolation entity is a transformation, okay, G on my original observed data to the data that I will then interpolate then we create an interpolating function for the transformed values u, for the interpolation entities u, and then we do the re-transformation back and my function f that interpolates the y's, yeah, the yi um, is then g inverse of x and h of x. Okay, and um, the choice um, of a good interpolation entity is maybe 
yeah, very important, maybe even much more important than, than the choice of uh, the interpolation method. We will see that piecewise constant and uh, piecewise uh, linear work quite well if you interpolate the right the right quantity. And you also had this for other applications yeah, in numerical methods. For example, re recall stochastic processes. Yeah? If you have a log normal process and you know that the process stays positive, it is much better to discretize, use Euler scheme and so on, the logarithm of the process. So you use Ito's lemma to transform the process to another state space. You do all the numerical methods there in your transformed state space, and then you transform back. Okay, so this state space transformation or here interpolation entity is an important um, ingredient. Yeah, so now we have some good idea. Okay, so we have an idea what we need to implement for a curve. We also have the idea already in mind, in mind that curves could depend on each other. Uh, so let's speak a little bit about an interpolation. So I create a very general implementation of a curve. Yeah? So just in R2, uh, our application interest rates in mind. Um, so there will be an interface. I have an interface that is called curve. So this interface just has the method, okay, give me the value. Yeah, so say for a given x, okay, and the curve should implement this. Uh, but maybe since a curve could depend on another curve, the additional argument or some, to say, say uh, to some extent, the context of the interpo interpolation is to also provide our model. So provide him a reference to the other curves if he need the other curves. Then we create our implementation. Our implementation yeah, is, for example, different interpolation algorithms. And maybe there could be also uh, an interface for discount curve or forward curve just to distinguish these objects when we then value financial products. Yeah, So that the financial product can say, okay, I would like to have a curve that I use as a discount curve and I would like to have a curve that I use as a forward curve. This model, which I had on the previous slide, is just a collection of all curves. So this is here my model. So in case we have dependencies. Yeah? So we like to allow complex interdependencies of the curves. So I already gave you two motivations why I would like to allow this. One motivation is that a curve could be just a function of another curve. The forward curve is calculated just from another discount curve. No? So it should then ask the other curve for that. Or if I think of calibration, if I value a financial product and I like to maybe calibrate, optimize this value here with an optimizer, but this curve has changed, yeah? So maybe I have to get both curves yeah, to reflect the change of the discount curve in the recalibration of the forward curve. Yeah, now comes a little bit subtle uh, point in the implementation. Of course, in an object-oriented implementation, you have different objects now representing your curves. And it is okay to have an object referencing another object. Yeah? So for example, the forward curve needs the discount curve to calculate the forward. Um, I do this reference not by having, say, a reference, speaking in Java or speaking in C++ or C, a pointer, a pointer to the other object. I use this by having the name of the other curve 
And when I call the method get value, I get the model and this model here is just a map that tells me which name is mapped to which curve. Yeah, so you could have the Euro STR discount curve, and then you could have the Euro STR forward curve, and the Euro STR forward curve needs the Euro STR discount curve. The reason is that later in my calibration algorithm, I like to exchange the discount curve, maybe with a different one, but the forward curve should then automatically find the new curve. So I have the additional argument, the model inside this get value method. And when I ask a curve for a value, it can look up another curve in this model, but it looks it up by the name. So this is, for example, here, my model, so my curve model, yeah, or here an implementation of this curve model. And this curve model is just a map, a map that maps from a string, which is the name, to a certain curve that I maybe need for the calculation. Okay, so, and you can just ask him, give me that curve. There is also maybe a little bit specialized method, give me a discount curve, where he is just checking if the object that is referenced under that name, yeah, so you see there's the discount curve name here, is a discount curve, and then it will do the casting and give you that back. Yeah, that's a subtle implementation detail, yeah, maybe you have, maybe you do not have to worry about this. Um, so my framework is like that. I specify interfaces, say an interface for a curve, a very general interface that just has the method, okay, I would like to know the name of that curve. Uh, is it a Euro curve? Is it a US dollar curve? And what, what uh, index is it referencing or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I would like to have the interpolated value or the predicted value for a certain argument. So there is here the get value method yeah, for um, a certain argument. And then I have an implementation, for example, an impl implementation that is creating different interpolation algorithms. I also have specialized interfaces for discount curve and forward curve, but you see that these interfaces just do a renaming that you can ask now for a discount factor for a certain maturity. Yeah. So actually this is just the renaming of give me the value for a certain argument. But then later when we write down the product valuation code, it's maybe much nicer to write a discount curve, give me the discount factor for a certain maturity because then you immediately see that this object is providing discount factors, so zero cover bond prices for certain maturities. So that's sometimes also called a marker interface. So I'm just marking um, uh, that this curve is uh, of a special special type and I'm providing then maybe just a better, better name for this very generic method, give me the value. And the same for the forward, yeah. And for the forward, the parameter X, that is T in the discount factor, the maturity for the forward, it is the fixing. Yeah, I would like to have that uh, the forward for a given fixing time of the index. You also see our special implementation that I can calculate a forward curve from a discount curve. And you see this is done because now two little ingredients. This object knows the name of some other discount curve. It knows this name. And we get the model when we ask for 
the value. Yeah, so I can check the model. Okay, model, please give me the corresponding discount curve for that name. And then I can perform this calculation. So this thing here is just doing the PT1 minus PT2 divided by T2 minus T1 times PT2. Yeah, so this guy is just performing this calculation by referencing another discount curve. So you see, if you know the UML language, uh, you would think that this guy here would own a reference to some discount curve, but this is not the case. I just reference it by name and I will fetch it from the model because I would later like to allow that we can replace the discount curve and he's just using then a different one under that, under that name. Let's focus a little bit on the curve interpolation. Okay, interpolation methods and entities. Yeah, entities, we could immediately interpolate the value or maybe other popular entities uh, take the logarithm, yeah, maybe for the zero Cooper bond curve. Or if you have the other example, take the logarithm and divide by time, yeah, by the maturity. So that would be, I interpolate log of y divided by x. Um, interpolation methods. Yeah, we could think of piecewise constant. Then if you think of piecewise constant, it is maybe a difference if you choose yeah, the constant to be continuous from the left. Yeah, so that point belongs there. Okay, maybe let's draw it like that. And then the next one is like that. Okay, or if you have something that is piecewise constant, but right continuous, you know, maybe you could, you could distinguish this piecewise constant right continuous, which would be the interpolation that is continuous from the right. Okay, so that's not belonging here and something like this. Yeah, so this is the piecewise constant right continuous and this is the piecewise constant left continuous. Classic alternative is linear interpolation you could also think of cubic spline, harmonic spline, whatever. I have some of these interpolations in my implementation. Yeah, let's do a small code session. So you have these interfaces. You also have some implementations here. For example, we have our uh, Nelson Siegel parameterization here. We have our interpolating curves here. And you can look this up in this repository. Okay. Um, yeah, this is here in this, this package. So we can have a look at this and then maybe you can do some small um, experiment to teach you a few things. Yeah. So in this library, we have a lot of stuff. Yeah, some models and there's here the section on market data. So there we find also here our, our model. Okay, that model is also having a map for volatility surfaces, but it's just here, this map from string to curve. And we have our interfaces. So the interface curve, yeah, which just has the name. Uh, it also has this reference date. So this is the date, okay, because sometimes I need really schedules that are in, in real time, in date. So this is what I associated with, with the mathematical point t equals zero. This is my date. Um, then I have here the get value method. And you see there is the interface discount curve, which is maybe just the renaming that now has get discount factor with an argument that is called maturity. And you also see that we have the possibility to pass to a certain curve and whenever that is possible, that should be done, uh, the model. So in case that curves needs another curve. Let me show you two examples. The discount curve 
with the Nelson Siegel parameterization. Okay, that's here our Nelson Siegel parameterization. So you see, it's just um, a few uh, parameters that you provide. Okay, and then you can calculate here this 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 parameterization. So the curve has certain parameters. Yeah. So the specification of the curve is just the parameters. Or our other example, the forward curve that is calculated from a discount curve. Yeah? So forward curve from a discount curve. So it knows the other discount curve by a name. Yeah? So that's the reference to the other discount curve. And from that name, it is asking the model, okay, model, please give me the corresponding discount curve. You see this here is the model that is popped in. Okay, so give me the corresponding discount curve. And then from that discount curve, we just calculate here the ratio yeah, as we had it in the course. Yeah, okay, so then the, you see that the T2 minus T1 is actually um, a day count fraction. And you could provide a day count convention to calculate the T2 minus T1. So you see there is already some more complicated stuff behind this than just to have a mathematical formula, one divided by T2 minus T1, because that curve could also have its specific day count convention to calculate this forward from a discount curve. Okay, so we have looked at a few of these guys. So the forward curve from discount curve, and maybe let's focus now a little bit here on the interpolation guy. So curve interpolation. So this is the guy that makes a lot of work. So you see there are, different interpolation methods that you can specify here, harmonic spline, cubic spline, different interpolation entities. You could create more. No? So this is just a small set. So I define an internal object here point that is just um, the time and the value. And then there is a method that converts the interpolation entity to the final value because I'm interpolating the interpolation entity. And um, the, the main um, interpolation routine is actually in um, another class, yeah? So this rational function uh, interpolation, yeah? Which is then performing the complicated interpolation stuff. So maybe we don't have to dig in into this. Let's play a little bit with these curves. Yeah, maybe I just create here in this project, uh, say a new class. So I will later give you the um, repository where you can find this. So maybe I create here a class that is called, say, curve experiments. I would like to have a main method to do some experiments. So this here is the project from the American methods. So the only thing we need is a project that is actually referencing our library because I would like to use the curves from this library. And I also reference here this plotting extension because I would like to plot uh, a little bit the curve. So uh, let's create a small experiment and let's do first test of the curve um, where I maybe play a little bit with different interpolation methods and entities. So I can create an object curve interpolation. Okay. So you see that object has 
different parameters. It has a name, it has a reference date. Okay, that is not needed for us here. Interpolation method, extrapolation method, entity, the times, you know, the arguments and the values. Okay, so let's use this constructor. So it's a name, yeah, just give it a name. I don't need the date here. Let's have some interpolation method. So interpolation method should be maybe piecewise constant. Okay, let's have some extrapolation method. Extrapolation method should be, say, just constant. And let's have some interpolation entity. Say, just interpolate the value itself. Okay, then of uh, what? Yeah, so what? are the values that I like to interpolate. Let's give him some arguments. So he should have, think of a zero Cooper bond curve now. So I start in time zero, uh, then I have one year, two year, maybe have a larger step, five year, 10 years. Yeah? So these are the observed market data. And let's have some values that we observe. Okay, zero Cooper bond price in zero is one. Then maybe after one year, it's 90%. Yeah? Okay, after two years, it's 80%. Uh, maybe now it's decreasing a little bit slower. So let's have after five years, only 0.6, 60%, and even a bit slower. So after 10 years, 0.4. Four. Uh, so let's have something like that for our curve. So now I have this curve and I would like to have a plot of this curve. So plot curve, curve is a function. Okay, I need to implement this function. Let's do that here. Uh, I have a nice library that can plot um, double unary operators. So this is my interpolation. So the interpolation is now X maps to curve get value. Okay, I don't need to provide this model because this curve does not depend on another curve. So let's take the shortcut and just use that model, that function here. Okay, so actually if you look into this function, um, You see that this function, if I do not provide the model argument, is just calling this guy with a model null. Yeah, so hopefully the curve is not using the reference to another curve. Yeah, I would like to plot this interpolation. So there is a small class that eases this pain of creating plots. Let's plot this guy. I have to import this here and let's run our little experiment. So here is our little experiment. And that's my curve. Okay, piecewise constant interpolation of the zero Cooper bond price curve is maybe not so nice. Yeah? So maybe nicer is to use the linear one. So linear, Looks nicer, but okay, I have these kinks here. Uh, that doesn't look that doesn't look nice. Let's use something smooth. Let's use our uh, cubic spline. Let's lose, use cubic spline. Yeah, okay, so that looks quite good. Yeah. Uh, still, there is a kink here. And now to an interesting thing. Uh, let's make this value here even a bit higher. Yeah? Let's have it, for example, be an 0.6, which means the zero Cooper bond price stays constant, which means interest rates are zero. Okay, so interest rates are zero for the region from 5.0 to 10.0. And you see that the cubic spline now has the defect that he is creating actually an undershoot yeah, to create its smoothness. Okay, so here from the 10, it's the constant extrapolation going from 
the five to to the ten ten here. Yeah, so the the under should is actually created here. So I would like to have a horizontal line here. But cubic spline does not create, does not like to create a kink here. So he is creating this undershoot and then he's going into the constant extrapolation. So you see, it's maybe not so nice to have this uh, cubic spline. The piecewise linear does not have the defect. So this here is the extrapolation, the constant extrapolation, and he's just creating this kink here. But piecewise linear does not look nice. Okay, so what I can do is I can change the entity. Yeah? So if I know that this is a zero Cooper bond price curve, maybe it's much nicer to interpolate the logarithm of the value. Okay, so what you have if you interpolate the logarithm of the value is that you already have some kind of more smooth shape. Yeah, it looks more like an exponential, and you have this constant extrapolation. If you like, you can change also the extrapolation here to a linear. You see then the extrapolation changes, and that curve already looks maybe much more reasonable, huh? but we use very simple interpolation, extrapolation methods. Yeah. Yeah, what happens now if I also make this case here where I go to the 0 0.6 that is problematic for the spline? Yeah? Okay, so here you have that kink, that hard kink, yeah? and you also have this issue with now the spline. Okay, and now you can decide a little bit do you like to have that kinky part, that kink here, yeah? or do you favor this uh, undershoot problem from the spline? We could also think of changing the entity maybe to log of value divided by time, yeah? because then I'm a little bit interpolating the interest rate, the yield, but you have to be a little bit careful. Huh? That looks quite nice, but now if I have this flat extrapolation that, or this this kink, then you get something like this, yeah, which is very unreasonable. Okay, the thing is that you are now combining things that do not fit very well together. If you interpolate the logarithm divided by time, it means that the retransformation is the interpolated value times t. But then if you do a linear interpolation, linear is already like a times t between the two points, it will create some times t squared. So that does not look good. Yeah? What you have to do is the extrapolation has to be constant because it is then the constant inter interest rate times t. Okay. This is your exponential decay with the constant extrapolation. And also that guy here is still coming like the cubic spline from having linear interpolation on something that is then later times t. So you could have a constant, piecewise constant interpolation method. And it would look like that. Okay. That doesn't look really nice. Okay, so the piecewise constant is creating now uh, jumps. So you see uh, the interplay of these interpolation methods and the interpolating entity is really complex, but having a well-suited interpolating entity then maybe a simple interpolation method like linear fits well. I will continue this little experiment, but let's continue a little bit in the lecture. Um, I will do another experiment on our problem with the locality. To illustrate the 
problem with the locality. Let's speak now about product valuation. So I also show you now the code that performs the valuation using our curves. So we provide the set of curves for product valuation in terms of our curve model or our analytic model in the code, it is the analytic model because it can also contain volatility surfaces and other analytic uh, model data. And we would like to value financial products from, from these. So I already looked at our model. So maybe now look at implementations of financial products like the swap leg or the swap. So just recall our model is providing a curve under a certain name or also um, specialized a discount curve uh, under a certain name for that discount curve or a forward curve curve under a certain name for that forward curve. So if I provide you with this model, you can ask, okay, let's give, give me that curve. So then we have here products. So you see there is also an interface, the analytic product. So that interface just says the product can calculate the value of the financial product given some model. So given a collection of curves. A swap is just the difference of two such products, namely the receiver leg and the payer leg. Okay, so there are two swap legs. So the value, the valuation function of this swap is very short. Yeah? It's just call the receiver leg to calculate the value given this model, call the payer leg to calculate the value given this model and the value is receiver what what do i receive minus payer okay so that's just a very trivial class here and the true implementation is then in this swap leg so the swap leg is now the guy that we had on the slide so it has a certain schedule so the schedule are the different periods period start period end that gives me the day counting, T2 minus T1, or here TI plus one minus TI. It has the fixing of the index and it has the payment time of this index where the index can have an additional spread. Yeah? So the spread is something that I add onto this index. So the index is calculated from that forward curve then I add some constant to it, a spread. I multiply both with some notional. This is a vector here. The vector corresponds to this schedule for every period. And then I multiply this with the discount curve. So this guy is exactly implementing this routine here. So these guys here, are all described by the schedule. This is my forward curve. This is my discount curve. This guy is my spread, which I add to this forward. And this guy here is my notional, which I multiply to this value on this value, yeah, and the notional can even depend here on time, so it is a vector. So you see, these are the ingredients. There is a little bit subtle point. There is something uh, called a notional reset, yeah, in some financial products, which we do not discuss here. So the constructor just um, provides all this stuff: the schedule, the name of the forward curve, and so on. The name of the forward curve may be empty. It may be null. Uh, in that case, uh, we are just paying the constant. We are just paying the spread. So this is a very flexible implementation. And the valuation you find here, uh, it's not so long. So 
The first thing is that we fetch from the provided model, we fetch the discount curve. So we fetch it at evaluation time, we fetch it in case it had has been changed by some calibration algorithm. So I fetch the discount curve. Um, I also fetch from the model, the forward curve. So you see here, there is the forward curve, which I fetch from the model. So it could be that I do not get a forward curve. For example, if that name here is empty or null, yeah, in that case, I will just ignore it. And then I loop over all periods from this schedule. Okay, I loop over all periods and I just calculate um, the value. Okay, so my forward is, the coupon is this constant plus the value I get from the forward curve. And then this is multiplied with the period length, with the discount factor and the notional. And the discount factor is calculated from my discount curve, where this discount curve is also fetched from the model. Yeah? That was here on top. Okay, so there is a little bit fancy stuff uh, going on with timing and this notional exchange. But apart from that, maybe you can ignore this. It's really very, very simple stuff. Yeah, ask the curve for the values, uh, multiply the values and calculate the sum. So maybe let's play a little bit with this swap leg. So go back to our small experiment and have another experiment here that is called test the swap leg. And I would now play a little bit with this guy. Okay, so I do not want to see the plot whenever I run this program. So let's comment that guy out. And yeah, um, let's create a very simplified swap. So um, I could create now um, a fully fledged schedule having a business day calendar date rule conventions. Yeah, I have an example which you can look up in the repository. I would just create maybe um, a simplified schedule. And for that, I have a nice class time discretization, which I sometimes also use in other simulation applications. And that time discretization allows me to just specify the initial value, the number of time steps and the step size. Yeah, so this here is going from 0 0.0 to 0 0.5. Yeah, so every half year and up to the last one is 5.0. So if you would like to have the last one, uh, we can have a look at this. So then this is the schedule gener generator, but um, that generates these fully fledged schedule, but I would like to have a simplified one. And there is um, a helper class that can create such a schedule from this time discretization. So now this schedule, if you take a look, you can ask it for the periods. Yeah? And when you take a look to the periods, you see um, it has um, a fixing, a payment, a period start, period end. And this little thing is just doing the simple, simple thing that period start is the previous period end, period start is the fixing, period end is the payment time. It's the textbook schedule. Yeah, let's have a look. What is the maturity? What is the last one in the schedule? So I can ask the schedule, give me the periods, yeah, or maybe give me the payment time of the last period. So I ask get payment from the last period. Okay, and maybe I can print this. And let's see what we what we have as maturity. It should be 5.0. Okay, so you see this is 5.0. So my schedule ends in 5.0, which is this time discretization. So let's, um, yeah, so now I could create the swap, but before we create the swap, let's create maybe some curves. I first create um, a discount curve. I would like to value a swap and so it should have some discount 
curve. So I use now the discount curve that has this interpolation method. And there are uh, nice little helpers. They are, for example, um, helpers that can create the discount curve from zero rates. Yeah. So when I provide the R, yeah, 5%, then he is just calculating at that time it is e to the r minus rt. Yeah? So I have a small little helper here that creates a discount curve of a given name. Yeah? So let's call this euro str. This is my euro curve. And I would like to have that curve with certain values. So let's use uh, in one year, I would like to have something in two years, maybe in five years. So that is my maturity. I would like to have a sample point, then maybe some sample points later. So that is five years. So let's have 5.5, 6.0, 6.5. Okay. And after that is extrapolation because I do not need more values. Okay. That yeah, because my swap is ending in 5.0. So maybe let's have this as my time points where I have observed market data and the values that I have observed. Okay, so now this is creating this from zero rates. So these are now interest rates. Say it's 5%, 5%, 5%. Five percent. Yeah, it's a flat curve. It's always five percent. Okay, so that's a discount curve. Let's import this. Uh, you can also specify which interpolation method you would like to use. Uh, let's use uh, certain methods. So we use the interpolation method. Uh, let's use linear. Let's use extrapolation also linear. And let's use as entity the logarithm of the value. Okay, why is he telling me that this is deprecated? Ah, he needs this reference state. Okay, so let's have some reference state here. So this is just October uh, you know, 23. Okay, he, he just likes to have it, but actually it's not important uh, for us. Okay, so now he's fine with us. Um, as a forward curve, let's use the forward curve that is calculated from the discount curve. So I use this class forward curve from discount curve. And he likes to have the name of the discount curve. So that is actually this name here. So I can just say, okay, this discount curve, get the name. And as another argument, he likes to have, what have what does he like to have there? As the third argument, okay, some payment offset code. Okay, we can ignore that guy. So now I can create my model. So this is my model. So this is my analytic model from the curves. So I just give him these curves as a, a vector. So he should have this curve in his model and that curve in his model. I need to import this guy. So now he's fine with that. So now I have a model. Last step is to create my financial product. So let's create my product. So this is my last step. That product is my swap leg. So maybe I create a pure floating leg. So this is my swap leg. I have the schedule for this product. I have a certain forward curve a forward curve name, uh, the spread, the constant should be zero and the discount curve is the discount curve with this 
name. Yeah. So if you look here, the swap leg likes to have the schedule, the name of the forward curve, the spread, and the name of the discount curve. Okay, this is now my product, and I can calculate the value. So the value is ask this financial product to calculate the value in zero with this model. Okay, so now let's calculate the value. And you see there is some 22%, yeah, is the value of this swap. Um, okay. Actually, you can now check that this value is exactly the zero copper bond at the beginning. So this is the discount curve get value in the beginning minus the zero copper bond at the end. Yeah? So this is the value at maturity because that is what we have calculated as the value of the floater so let's check if this is true. Yeah, it's true. Okay, so there is some machine precision thing here going on, but that's the value. Yeah, okay, so uh, what happens now if you change here the interpolation method? Yeah, so maybe let's change this to cubic spline. So remember 22, 11, 9, 9 easy to remember, you get the same value. The reason why you get the same value is because I have this property and the values in between the interpolation doesn't even matter. Because we have that this value of this floating leg, it pulls the value of the forward and of the discount curve in between, but we have this nice little property. This is different if we look at, for example, a fixed leg. Yeah? So if I define a fixed leg, this means that I do not use the forward curve, but instead I have a constant, which I pay. Let's pay 5%. Okay, let's have that below here. So this guy is the float leg. This guy is the fixed leg. And let's calculate now the value of the fixed leg by asking the fixed leg for this value. And let's print this value. So now maybe I do it a bit nicer, okay. So you see the value of the fixed leg is different from this guy. Okay, actually, why is it different? Because here I have 5% and here I have a complete constant 5%. Well, these are zero rates. So this is the E to the minus RT. And this is a 5% forward rate. Forward rate, zero rate is a different thing. Yeah, but now if you change the interpolation, so remember this value here, 21.84457. If you now inter change the interpolation, 8.445. If I change the interpolation from cubic spline uh, to, to linear and back, yeah, it doesn't change something because I have the right uh, interpolating object here, the log of value of these zero rates, the constant zero rates, it doesn't make a change. Yeah? So it would maybe make a change if we have not um, a flat curve, yeah? or if I would have, for example, value here, let's try that. It should maybe make a difference. 
9181. Yes, you see, if you have a different interpolation entity, then changing the interpolation method suddenly does a change. But it is a small change. You wouldn't care. Let me conclude this little example with something that looks really hard. Yeah. So let's have this setup, which is maybe a nice setup. And let's check now this locality. So this is what we observe at one year, two years, and this is what we observe at maturity. And this is what we observe right after maturity, half a year after maturity. Let's change that value. Look what happens to our fixed leg. This is 21844. So I change this value here, say 2 and 0.02. It's the same value, 21844. So this interpolation method here keeps this locality. So it does not react on data that is observed after that. Now let's use the cubic spline for interpolation method. So I have a very similar value, 21844. But now I change this observation, say also to the 2%. And you suddenly get a big change. Yeah, so this is already a big change. I mean, this is 10% of the value that has changed. Yeah? So if you change that guy to a different value, you see that suddenly the financial product is reacting to values that you observe after the maturity of the financial product. Okay, so that was our little experiment you can find this code of this experiment here in this uh, repository, in this package under this name, Curve Experiments. And maybe you like to play a little bit with this. Let's conclude the lecture with some concluding remarks on the calibration. So my calibration should be a generic setup so my generic setup consists of um, a model. So actually, there's a typo here on my slide. This should be model. So my model is just this map from a name to a curve, you know, my collection of curves. Then every curve has parameters. Is it the Nelson-Siegel parameterization? So it is a parameterized curve. It has these five parameters of the Nelson-Siegel curve or Nelson-Siegel-Svensson curve. Or is it an interpolating curve? Then, okay, the interpolation points are your parameters. And you can now combine the parameters of all those curves to a single parameter vector. So your whole model has a parameter vector. This is the parameter vector, every curve provides parameters and the collection of all parameters defines a single parameter vector. Then I observe market prices. The market prices are then the target values that I have to match when valuing the corresponding products using the model. So all these guys together define then the error vector model price minus observed price. And I can just apply to this huge optimization problem, input vector maps to output vector, now a multidimensional optimizer, for example, uh, a Levenberg Marquardt optimizer. And he likes to minimize the error vector in some norm for interpolating guys. He finds maybe the right uh, solution where to place the interpolation points on the curves. From my previous experiment with the locality, you now have maybe a good intuition where you should place the interpolation points. So the interpolation points should maybe placed at the last time where you expect the financial product to depend on values of the curve, because then you will get a perfect locality when you use such an interpolation method like piecewise constant.
So you see that the observed financial products define also or influence the structure of the curve where you should place the interpolation points of the curves. So we choose the abscissa of the interpolation point, the TK, yeah, such that um, TK is the time that defines the maturity of the financial product, at least in the case when we consider the zero Cooper bond curve. For the forward, it could be a little bit different, yeah, because the fixing is sometimes a period before. The good thing is that this will guarantee an exact fit if you have for each maturity a single interpolation point and you do not observe multiple maturities and it will also um, create this very nice um, locality. Our experiment showed in spline interpolation may not guarantee this. In some cases, you have that you have a sequence of financial products with increasing maturities where you know that the valuation of a financial product depends only the interpolation points that are on or before that maturity. In that case, you can convert your n-dimensional problem into n one dimensional problems because you can first calibrate the first point, then the second point, then the third point to the first product, the second product, the third product. Okay. Uh, this is a big improvement with respect to speed. Yeah. N dimensional optimizers are much slower than n times one dimensional optimizers. But uh, it requires a special structure. And since I would like to have a generic calibration, since I would like to have a framework that I just can use for all applications, uh, I just use an n-dimensional optimizer here. So we just use a generic high-dimensional optimizer. And really, this stuff is fast enough. Yeah? So I do, don't need to do this, but you can, you can do it. <laughs> Last remark, I already mentioned this, we have some kind of late binding. So the curves are referenced by their name. Okay, so uh, we favor immutable objects. We like to replace a curve in the model with another curve that has the same name. So such that other curves that, that need this curve find this. You can look at these two unit tests here to see how such a calibration looks like. Yeah, for example, this small calibration test here, he will use this optimizer. Okay, and then we are done for this lecture. So let's have just a look maybe at this last test here. So it is the unit test. So you find it under test. It is called the calibration test, uh, yeah, this guy here, you see he's checking different interpolation methods. And okay, there are different calibration tests here. So for example, let's have a look at this guy. So he's creating a discount curve, okay, a very small one. It just has a very few interpolation points. He is creating the forward curve, which is just the forward curve from that discount curve. He's creating financial products. These are four swaps. So he would like, okay, this point here is already fixed. He would like to fit these four points here to these four observations. Okay, then all you do is you tell this optimizer here, that you should use this model of the curves, these two curves, to match these financial products. Okay, and he would he, he is doing the calibration, and then we just check if the calibration uh, worked. Okay, so maybe you can you can run this. This is this this method. Yeah, it has some other method, and he's just oops, why is that? Oh, 
I don't know why, it, why it's not working. Hmm. It worked before. So, okay, let's, uh, let's finish the lecture because I'm already over time, I see. Uh, I was not used that I started at 10.30. Um, yeah, okay, so he, he, he checks here the calibration and you can maybe experiment a little bit with this unit test. That was it for today. And next session will then start building big interest rate model models using yeah, high dimensional stochastic processes with correlations and all this stuff. Yeah, a discrete forward rate term structure model. That was it for today. Thanks. We can run the curve calibration method as a standalone test. Okay, and you see he's trying to calibrate the points of the discount curve. Yeah, and he checks that he's matching all these swap values. The swaps are par swaps. Yeah, so the value of the swap should be zero. Uh, so par rate swaps. Okay, and he's doing this for different interpolation methods and inter different interpolation entities. Yeah, so if the entity is the zero cobra bond value itself, you will see the zero cobra bond value. Uh, the entity could also be an interest rate. Yeah, so you see different different interest rates and so on, different interpolation methods, and he's performing the calibration. That was it. Thanks.